Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining our session today. Uh, just a quick introduction. My name is Aman, and I, along with my colleague Vikram, uh, will spend the next 20 to 25 minutes talking to you about how cutting edge uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning techniques can really help you and your business become more data centric. And from an insights perspective, how you can get to better insights faster. Uh, both of us have been working in this area of data strategy and engineering for the last uh, nine to 10 years, and we are really excited to share our learnings with you today. So let's get started. Uh, you know, each day we wake up, these are really challenging times, and each day we wake up uh, to a new headline about how the COVID-19 pandemic is impacting millions of people. Uh, some are losing their lives. Uh, others are losing jobs and uh, still others must risk everything to provide essential services. Uh, every business is getting impacted by this pandemic and uh, some industries like restaurants and travel are feeling significant impact right now versus some other industries, uh, you know, haven't seen the impact yet. But the truth is that, you know, all businesses, all of our consumers and customers are going to be impacted in one way or another. Uh, if there is one silver lining in all of this, it is that, you know, we're, as we're getting to spend some more time with our families, uh, both Vikram and I have 10 year old daughters and both of us are thankful uh, in these really challenging times to at least be spending some time to time with them. So, uh, you know, getting back on topic, uh, the question on everybody's mind is that, you know, as this disruption has happened, what will happen in the future? And, uh, you know, in these uncertain times, we turn to experts in trends to give us guidance from, uh, you know, what they have seen historically and how they are reading the tea leaves about what happens in, in the future. Um, so a quote from our chief knowledge officer rings true at this time, right? That disruptions shape the future by fast tracking emerging trends. So what this means is that trends that we could already see as an insights community we expect these trends to come at us even faster. I will get to those trends in just a minute, but I do want to plug, uh, you know, a lot of great thought leadership content that is available on the Kantar website. So when you have a chance, you know, please feel free to uh, check it out. So, uh, you know, let's take a minute to review what trends we were seeing uh, within the insights community, uh, even before the COVID-19 pandemic. And, uh, you know, so I'll, I'll go through a few of these. Uh, the first one is just around reducing time from data to insight. Uh, so with the advent of technology, uh, big data, AI and ML, there is an emphasis across organizations to get from data to insight faster. Right. Uh, the second trend, uh, you know, that, that we've seen with organizations is uh, the focus on being able to leverage existing data sets and to get more out of those data sets. So me and my team, we speak to a lot of large organizations, and this is really a big focus for them uh, to you know, get more out of data that they already have. And finally, a key place where all of us really add value as an insights and a market research community is being able to tell stories with data, right? Uh, but it is no longer enough to just take one data source to tell a story. Uh, but it's important to really look at business, uh, business problem across multiple data sources and to be able to triangulate information to weave a story of what's happening with our businesses, with our consumers and customers. So what happens in the future? We expect these trends to fast track and become even more significant. So next, um, you know, I'm going to get start getting into the weeds a little bit and talk about one other challenge we face um, as an insights community, which is the data that we deal with, right? And most of us deal with marketing data and marketing data is often complex and nuanced. So let's spend a little bit of time talking through these complexities, right? So when it comes to first party data, which is data generated by companies like shipment data or finance data, um, you know, or sales data from a restaurant company, for example, this data is extremely granular, uh, which is actually a great thing. And, you know, we, we love granular data. Uh, but the challenge is that that granularity doesn't match with other data sets like, you know, syndicated data or an equity data, which might be at a much higher level. 
uh, when it comes to syndicated data, often uh, you know syndicated data would come from different syndicated data sources, and they, the data might have issues around you know the brand names not being consistent, uh, you know the the metric names not being consistent, and bringing this data all together is often a challenge. Uh, when it comes to survey data, uh, survey data comes with its own set of nuances. Uh, you know, survey data is typically at a respondent level, uh, which makes this very unique and comes with uh, typically comes with a set of rules around weights, filters, sample sizes, etc. So you know, all of these different types of data have their own nuances, uh, but there are some challenges that come you know when you're uh, when you're using this data that come across all of these data sets, right? So, uh, you know, some of these challenges are often around data harmonization, uh, different data sets might have different hierarchies, and, uh, you know, uh, to bring it all together is often a challenging and a time-consuming um, effort that one has to do before, you know, you can start using all of these data sets to ultimately, uh, you know, generate insights and, and tell a story. Just to kind of... Uh, summarize this what i've spoken about is primarily you know there are a lot of uh, uh, issues in being able to bring data together and uh, you know there are nuances there as well so what most organizations are doing is using data engineering to solve these challenges right and ultimately what our priority as an insights community is to be able to get from data to insights in a much faster way and uh, you know one of the ways that we can do that is by using uh, data engineering, uh, you know, with ta by taking the help of data engineering. So uh, I'm going to pass this on now to my colleague Vikram, who's going to talk a little bit more about data engineering and also focus specifically around uh, AI and ML components that are really useful uh, within this space. So over to you, Vikram. Thanks, Amar. Let's now look at the data engineering process uh, that we you know typically follow for a project where you have data from multiple sources so once you uh, you know do the planning identify your business and technical requirements you go on to source the data you need for a project like this so this typically involves you know uh, data like retail scan brand trackers social and search and uh, all of these and uh, these data sources come from different providers so which essentially means they have their uh, own formats and thanks to that their own challenges when it comes to ingestion enrichment and harmonization a typical analyst spends anywhere between 60 to 70 percent of the time in a project trying to prepare data and make sure it is of good quality so that it can be consumed on a dashboard or used for further analytics there's always an attempt to try and reduce the the effort spent here because it's a cost driver but having said that there's also a need to ensure that data quality is not compromised what we've done is you know used our expertise in data understanding and brought it together with ai and ml techniques into the end-to-end -end data processing framework so starting with ingestion uh, for example uh, you want to automatically detect what data is coming in you want to you know, know if it is survey data, if it is retail scan data, you want to know if a certain variable uh, represents sales or something else. And this has to be an automated process. So that is the first step where you know, there is some amount of machine learning. Moving on to the enrichment process, once your data has been ingested, um, as you work through the preparation, you want to make sure that you eliminate anomalies in the data. And anomalies typically come in over time when you have time series data and there are updates to it. So uh, eliminating this is very important because uh, otherwise they could end up skewing the results you get uh, from the process data. So there are a few techniques, both supervised and unsupervised machine learning techniques that we put in place like RPCA, for example, to you know handle anomalies. When we move on in the process, and given that nowadays we work with data across multiple sources, there is a need to harmonize the data. So this means you need to, you know, have same brand names across data sources, same category names, for example. And for all of this, you need not only a master data system, but also some intelligence in how the data is mapped across um, these sources. And that's where, again, uh, you know, uh, machine learning techniques come in to help us not only speed up the process, but also get a high degree of quality and accuracy. 
So uh, let's uh, now try and you know get a little deeper into this. Let's try and understand uh, how some of this is handled by us, and uh, we'll take the example of detection of anomalies. Uh, out of the several techniques shown here, um, what I'll do is uh, get a little bit into detail with RPCA, which stands for Robust Principal Component Analysis, and this is an advanced version of the PCA or Principal Component Analysis technique uh, uh, that's available. So what RPCA does is splits your data into you know normal components, which is your low rank matrix, and your uh, erroneous or random noise components, which represents your anomalies. So if you look at the chart here, for example, uh, the uh, the chart in green uh, shows you you know the actual clean data, which has been extracted from the chart above it, which is the actual data. There are some uh, erroneous points which have been called out, and that's what is shown in the the last uh, chart in, in red, which shows anomalies. So in this case, as you can see, we have uh, you know roughly about four anomalies. And what these anomalies means are you know they are uh, deviation from the normal trend. And given the nature of the algorithm, it learns uh, over time. So uh, you know uh, it automatically knows how to pick up trends. So if your sales is going up, for example, uh, the uh, algorithm knows that there is an upward trend and hence new data which comes in uh, will not be flagged as anomalies. But if there is something against the trend, that will be typically flagged. So uh, to see this in action, um, let's uh, you know uh, see how it works on the actual platform called Olympus, which is uh, what we have built over time uh, to help with the data engineering process. So what Olympus does is uh, not only helps in data preparation, but also uses uh, ML and AI techniques in order to improve data quality. Uh, going over to Olympus, a few uh, key concepts, There's something called workspace, projects, and data sets. So workspace essentially is uh, uh, you know, the concept which helps you segregate data across various concerns. So for example, you could have uh, different markets in which you operate and you want to separate data across these for you know, GDPR kind of reasons. And you could do that. So workspaces uh, can be in different geographies as well because Olympus is designed to work on the cloud and taking advantage of the features there, it can you know, actually save data in different geographies. Then there's the concept of data set, which is where we refer to actual data files. Uh, in this case, let's take a look at uh, something called uh, you know, the viewership data here. This is the sample data which we have um, ingested here. And this is uh, from a streaming platform for views of a certain show on different devices. Uh, so in, how did the data get here in first place? Well, that's quite simple. You just come to uh, this upload button. You can select data from your computer, or you could upload it from Azure storage, AWS, or any other source. I've shown two sources here. A couple of others are not configured for this instance. But you could also get data from databases or APIs, uh, you, you know, uh, that's possible as well. So once data is ingested, uh, you can go and preview it. You can go take a look at, uh, uh, you know, what are the key metadata about it. And for that, you just have to click on this info, and that will show you that uh, this file has close to 16,000 records in five columns. And you can also get some quick stats about the data. So for example, if I click on this variable in the data, it shows me the distribution of, you know, uh, uh, the actual data itself. It shows me how the views are split across various devices. So this is a, you know, a, a quick sense check of what the data looks like. So the data I'm going to use today uh, for the detection of anomalies uh, is this file and the other one, which is uh, one is the historical file, one is the incremental file, uh, which comes in uh, regularly. So I can actually quickly take a look at what the data looks like. So there are a few columns here. So you can see date, number of views on that date, uh, what show it is, and you know um, on what platform the the, the view the viewership happened. So uh, let's take a look at how to process this now. So for this, I'll go into um, a project, and that's where another concept called the flow comes in. A flow is a, a bunch of steps uh, which are stitched together to process data. So if you look at it here, I have you know a, a six-step process. Uh, the first one being ingestion of data from two different sources. In this case, I have historical data and incremental data, two different files which are given as inputs. The next component is used to merge the files. The third one is used to deduplicate because remember we want to work with clean data, so we want to eliminate problems and duplicates are one of the problems we typically see. So it's a deduplication component. 
then you actually aggregate the views by day because the idea here is to see if there is an anomaly in the number of views of this video on a daily basis. So if there is a spike for sudden, for example, or there is a dip in viewership, that's what we want to detect and hence you have aggregated the views. And then there's the actual component on anomaly detection, which actually you know helps you detect uh, those anomalous records. Now it's as simple as just configuring this on a canvas, uh, absolutely no code required. Uh, an analyst can just come in here, select data, and then you know set this flow up. To run this, you just go and uh, uh, choose the data that you want to use. So in this case, uh, we are going to use the historical data and uh, we can use the incremental data. And given the way this is designed, this flow can be reused with any other data as well. So when I say run, um, this process now starts. Um, it takes a few seconds to start and um, once it starts, uh, what it does is create something called a job and the job runs in the background, allowing you to go and work on some other data for some other flow. So uh, once submitted, you can see what a, a typical uh, what happens in a typical flow. There are six steps here. Um, it will show you, uh, you know, what's happening at each. The color of this will change um, as you go along in the process. In the interest of time, I'll show you a flow which has already been executed earlier. And I click on this, you'll see what has happened. Um, we've completed all steps, so they are all uh, marked green, and the whole process took a little over four minutes. Uh, so if I go and say uh, look at merge files for example, it will tell me that uh, totally now I have roughly 35,000 records to deal with between my historical and um, new data and even detection of anomalies which is what I set out to do has been completed. So let's see what happens. I mean how do you get these anomalies? Well uh, let's look at the output of this flow. The output is uh, stored as another data set and when I go and uh, look at that file um, I can go and preview it and you will see that uh, a new column called is anomaly has been added. So this tells me whether uh, the viewership in a certain day is anomalous or not. Um, and uh, so to look at this uh, in a more detailed way, I'll open it in Excel because uh, this is only a sample. So out of the 35,000 records uh, uh, in this file, uh, only a few are shown here as a sample. So let's actually go and see how the, the data looks. And here it is. So here is my historical data which we saw earlier and the incremental data and uh, the anomalies which have been detected. So totally as we can see about uh, 76 anomalies have been detected in this process and this is something an analyst can then go and you know work on to see why these uh, rows are anomalous and whether they should be included in you know uh, our actual further data processing or not. So that's uh, typically, uh, you know, um, what a, a, a flow and the result of the flow in uh, uh, Olympus looks like. I can show you one more flow, which is a little more complex. Uh, so, for example, if I look at something called quarterly data processing, uh, it has far more components. Um, so as you can see, there are multiple inputs coming in here. So four different files because we are looking at data for four different quarters. We are merging them and then, you know, we are trying to uh, you know do some other calculation with uh, all of these. So that's the uh, idea with Olympus. You can prepare data, you can detect issues in the data and enrich it. So you can do master data management as well so that you can look up and get better quality data at the end of the whole process. So now uh, getting back to uh, the presentation. So we saw uh, what uh, Olympus could do. And this is a typical data engineering solution built for the marketing world. Now, uh, given all of us here, you know, come from a marketing and related background, uh, when we try to get a solution for us to do data engineering on our projects, what should we look at, right? So typically, you know, we should look at uh, a platform which has marketing focus. And why is that? Because marketing data sets are different. While there are, uh, you know, many platforms out there which will tell you that they can process data, marketing data sets have a certain nuances. Say, for example, take um, uh, a survey data. So survey data, uh, for example, changes um, every now and then new questions get added, something gets removed. So the data structure changes continuously. So you want the ability to automatically, you know, uh, handle these. Then there is, uh, you know, uh, social and search data where volumes are very large, which means you need a platform which can scale and that uses cutting edge technology. So that's where, you know, uh, 
this is the platform has to be built for tomorrow and not just cater to today's needs and finally given that these are it systems you have to work with it teams in order to deploy them in house and for that you need something which can easily fit in with your tech stack whether you use azure you use aws you use on premise servers doesn't matter there should be a platform which works across all of these and that's uh, what we made deployment easy so at cantar what we've tried to do is you know uh, try and address all of these and that's what uh, you know we tried to show you uh, through this short demo of uh, olympus so that's pretty much what we had for the day uh, thanks in for thanks for listening in